Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ves salatu ves selamu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn. Allahumme allimna ma yanfa'una ve anfa'ana bima 'allamtana ve zidna ilmen nafi'a. Allahümme erinel hakka hakkan varzukna ittiba'e ve erinel batıla batılan varzukna içtinabe. Rabbi işrah li sadri ve yassir li emri ve ahlul uqdeten min lisani yafqahu kavli. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuh. Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale-i Nur by Bediüzzaman Said Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of this series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. In this episode, inshallah, we will continue reading the 15th word. This is a treatise that Ustad Nusi wrote as an interpretation of uh, the the following verse. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. لَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَا وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِشَيَاطِينَ We have adorned the lowest heaven with lamps and made them missiles for stoning satans. The 67th chapter of the Qur'an and this is from the 5th verse. And then Ustad Nursi says, O you the school gentlemen whose mind is narrowed down by the spiritless matters of astronomy, Intellect has, whose intellect has descended to his eye and who cannot fi- fit the tremendous secret of this verse in his narrow mind. The firmament of this verse can be climbed with a ladder with seven steps. Come, we will climb together. Now, in the treatises before this, the you know, 14th, 13th, Ustad Nursi also talked about the Quran, the miraculousness of the Quran, and also some uh, prophetic traditions pointing out that some of these verses and prophetic traditions that have been subjected to criticism, which, uh, you know, must have been a a matter of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, and in some cases continues to today, are completely baseless. And these verses are actually, uh, you know, they, they are not subject to criticism. On the contrary, they are miraculous. They are pointing out, pointing to, uh, important wisdoms and, and realities. And in this verse 2, in the 15th word, Ustad Nursi shows to us how this verse and the rest of it uh, points to very important realities in existence. A reality as important as the um, confrontation between good and evil. And the ramifications of this implications consequences visible consequences of this in the in the creation so he said we can climb the firmament of this verse with a ladder with seven steps we read the first second and third steps and inshallah in this episode we will read the fourth and fifth uh, steps As a reminder, a rough translation of the text we are studying and reflecting upon can be found at the website that was mentioned at the beginning, that is www.reflections-rn.org. So, Bismillah, the fourth step. Bütün alemlerin Rabbi ve müdebbiri ve haliki olan Zat-i Zülcelal'in ahkamları ayrı ayrı pek çok namları ve ünvanları ve esma-i husnası vardır. Mesela ashab-ı nebi safında küffara karşı muharebe etmek için melaikeleri göndermesini iktiza eden hangi isim ve unvan ise o isim ve unvan iktiza eder ki melaike ile şeyatin ortasında muharebe bulunsun ve ahyar-ı semaviye, semaviyin ve eşrar-ı arzîn mabeynlerinde mübareze olsun. Evet, küffarın nüfus ve enfasları kabza-i kudretinde olan Kadir-i Zülcelal bir emirle, bir sayha ile onları mahvetmiyor. Rububiyet-i ammi unvanıyla, hakim ve müdebbir ismiyle bir meydan imtihan ve mübareze açıyor. 
So inshallah, a very important concept is going to be uh, examined here in this in this paragraph. Uh, it is part of the the larger uh, you know subject of the treatise about uh, the verse we read and the confrontation between good and evil, but it also points to a really important matter about the divine names and attributes of of God and how they manifest in the creation. So we should try to understand this carefully. The majestic entity, Zatuzul Jalal, God, who is the Lord, administrator, and creator of all realms. Lord, administrator, and creator of all realms. That is, he created it all, and he did not create it and leave it, you know, to, to go rest uh, so that it can keep working as a, you know, self-motivated machine or something like that no he is also administering it he is also in charge taking care of things and he is the lord he is he is caring for things nurturing things he is showing his care with his mercy providing right everything that manifests God's interaction with his creatures or the creatures in relationship to the creator, right? These are all included in the meaning of this word Lord or Rab, the majestic entity who is the Lord, administrator and creator of all realms, has many appellations, titles and beautiful divine names, each with a separate rule. Now the word rule here uh, you know, was a bit difficult to translate we need to pay attention and um the the same problem actually uh, you know exists in the in the turkish too when we say a separate rule what we mean is not that there are rules that govern these names but rather the interaction of the creatures um or, or the affairs of the creatures that are manifestations of these names are subject to different rules, different uh, patterns, if you will. These are rules that God wills into existence. So if he is the provider, that he is the provider, the, uh, you know, the, the manifestation of that he is the provider will be manifest in all the processes acts of provision that we observe in existence and we observe that those happen according to certain patterns regularities that god's god wills into existence and you know these can also be called sunnatullah or adatullah um, god's custom the majestic entity who is the lord administrator and creator of all realms has many appellations titles and beautiful names and there are separate rules that are manifest in you know each of these beautiful divine names or appellations or titles for instance so when we have an example inshallah it will be uh, clearer whichever divine name and title and tale that he sends angels to fight in the lines of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, against the disbelievers. And we know that this happened in the Battle of Badr, right? Uh, you know, most famously happened in the Battle of Badr. The uh, companions, the believers, were something like 313 individuals, and the disbelievers uh, were something like 1,000. Uh, so, under um, you know, regular circumstances one would expect that disbelievers the mushrik, mushrikun of the idolaters of Mecca uh, to win the battle but the believers won the battle and it, not only that they were less in number but they also had less weapons less uh, horses less armor etc but the believers won the battle and there are many narrations that uh, indicate that uh, there were angels who were fighting in the lines of the believers and these are narrations not only from the companions i.e. the uh, the uh, the Muslims the 
those who had already become companions of the Prophet وسلم, and were fighting with the believers in the Battle of Badr, but also uh, from people on the other side, from the lines of the disbelievers, some of whom became Muslim later on. So whichever divine name and title and tale that he sends, God sends angels to fight in the lines of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, against the disbelievers, it is that name and title that entail the existence of an ongoing battle between angels and satans and a confrontation between the good inhabitants of the heavens and the evildoers of the earth. So that angels fought on the side of the believers or that the believers and the disbelievers came to a fight, right? This is a manifestation of some of God's names, attributes, titles. And the same name or names, same attributes, same titles are manifest or the the same names and titles and uh, attributes entail right the existence of an ongoing battle between angels and satans and a confrontation between the good inhabitants of the heavens and the evil doers of the earth because you know it is god's custom we understand from that one instance the battle of badr that it is god's custom that there will be a struggle a confrontation between good and evil in the creation and there are wisdoms to it we talked about some of them before if that is god's custom we can expect to see it everywhere that god created and god is uh, manifesting his lordship his administratorship his uh, being the creator etc etc so we, if we see it in one place and we can relate it to God's names and attributes, then we can expect to see it everywhere. There is an extension from one example to the rest of the uh, creation, the rest of existence, as soon as we relate it to God and God's names and attributes. And since there is no place, no time, no such thing as you know other than what god has created other than god's creation right with the exception of god himself the necessarily existent being then we can expect to see this everywhere everywhere then it makes perfect sense that there will be a confrontation between angels and satans and then the good inhabitants of the heavens and evil doers of earth yes the majestic, all-powerful one who holds the disbelievers' souls in his grip of power is not destroying them simply with one command or a single blast. Now, that has also happened, as we know, in the cases of, let's say, the people of Nuh, السلام, the uh, people of Shid, السلام, Salih, السلام, uh, Hud, السلام, um, Moses, السلام, when disasters visited the Egyptians, etc., etc. That has also happened and can happen and is sometimes happening right but the the issue of this confrontation between good and evil is something that is not limited to, to those um singular acts in history or in our own experience it is a much broader thing it is everywhere with his gods right with his title of general lordship and his names the sovereign and the administrator he god opens an arena of testing and confrontation this entire creation is an arena of testing and confrontation and that testing and confrontation is an ongoing one that uh, the the uh, ramifications of which permits the entire entire created realm temsilde hata olmasın Görüyoruz ki nasıl bir nasıl ki bir padişahın daire-i hükümeti itibarıyla ayrı ayrı pek çok ünvanları isimleri bulunur. Mesela daire-i adliye onu hakimi adil ismiyle yad eder. Daire-i askeriye onu kumandanı azam namıyla bilir. Daire-i meşihat onu halife ismiyle zikreder. 
daire-i mülkiye onu sultan namıyla tanır. Muti ahali ona merhametkar padişah derler. Asi insanlar ona kahhar hakim derler. Daha bunlara kıyas et. İşte bazı vakit oluyor ki bütün ahali onun elinde olan o padişaha ali, ali, aciz, zelil bir asi bir emirle idam etmiyor. Belki hakim, hakimi adil ismiyle onu mahkemeye gönderir. Hem muktedir hem sadık bir memurunu tatif ve liyakatini biliyor. Fakat hususi ilmiyle, hususi telefonuyla onu tatif etmiyor. Belki haşmet-i saltanat ve tedbiri hükümet ünvanıyla mükafata istikakını teşhir etmek için bir meydana müsabaka açar, vezirini emreder, ahaliyi temaşaya da- davet eder, bir istikbali siyasi yaptırır, muhteşem bir imtihan ulvi neticesinde bir mecma de onu tatif eder, liyakatini ilan eder. Daha başka cihetleri bunlara kıyas, et, kıyas et. So we said, uh, inshallah with examples, the concept we started to talk about will become clearer. And here Ustad also uh, provides a, Ustad Nusi also provides a parable, a representation, which should inshallah make it really clear. So may there be no mistaken represent, representation. This is a parable. This is an example. This is a representation. Uh, take what is good in it and leave what what does what does not what cannot be carried on to our understanding of reality we see as an emperor has many titles and names with respect to the different departments of his rule so the parable is going to be an emperor a, a you know human emperor and obviously we know that god is not a human emperor we are going to learn something from how human emperors uh, you know, act or uh, you know how that concept or how that thing is and we will use that that which that we learn in order to try to understand what applies to God or what applies to God's manifestation in the in the creation because as we always say God's entity is not knowable it's beyond our ability to comprehend so as an emperor has many titles and names with respect to the different departments of his rule for instance what do you mean like what kinds of titles and names does an emperor have For instance, the Department of Justice refers to him with his name, the Just Sovereign. So the Emperor's state, uh, government has many branches. One of them would be the branch of justice, Department of Justice. Uh, in Turkish, this is daire, which could be translated as circle, uh, but department or office or branch uh, work better. The Department of Justice refers to him with his name, the Just Sovereign. Right? That is, that is the title of this emperor that is manifest, that is disclosed, uh, reflecting in the Department of Justice. The Department of the Military knows him with the appellation, the Tremendous Commander. So the you know president of most countries around the world, for instance, when it comes to the military, they are also the commander on, commander on, in chief, uh, commander in chief of the military. So you go to uh, the the presidential palace, and perhaps there is an um, you know, there is a there, there is an international event that's happening. There is a you know, diplomats are there, etc., etc. So the president there appears as the head of the state, as the president. But then the next day he might be visiting some army army uh, base and there he will be, or she will be, welcome as the commander-in-chief. For instance, the Department of Justice refers to him with his name, the Just Sovereign. The Department of the Military knows him with the appellation, the Tremendous Commander. The Department of Religious Affairs mentions him as the Caliph. The Department of Public Affairs knows, knows him as the Sultan. Obedient folk people call him as the Merciful Emperor. Rebellious people call him the All-Compelling Sovereign. And of course, since they are rebellious, they might not be uh, you know, willing to do this, but when they 
when the force, the might of the state finds them, uh, they see that he is the all compelling sovereign and so on. You think in comparison to these, like you can come up with other examples. Sometimes that exalted king who holds the entire population in his hands does not execute an impotent and debased re rebel with a command. So he could. There is an impotent debased rebel that's brought in front of uh, the, the, the, the kin, king in the palace and the king can say, you know, perhaps he has executors there. Just get rid of this man, right? But sometimes he doesn't do that. He does not execute an impotent and debased rebel with a com command. What does he do? Rather, he sends him to the court with his name, just sovereign. Now, when he sends him to the court, right, he is there too. Yes, there will be a judge at the court. Perhaps there will be a prosecutor, lawyers, etc., etc. But the judge is there because he is appointed by the just sovereign and he is representing the just sovereign the judge does not judge in his own name the judge judges in the name of the just sovereign therefore the just sovereign is in the court too furthermore he knows that the faithful official merits being favored so he is an official officer official and has served well and and there, this person uh, deserves to be uh, given some rewards and favored perhaps prom promoted etc but he does not limit his favor the king does not limit his favor to his private knowledge calling the official on a private line right the king could have called this man and said thank you i really love you you have my favor uh, you are my favorite uh, official etc uh, etc et the, the, the king could do this but it would only be the king and this official who would know it but sometimes the king wants to promulgate what is going on so rather with this sublimity of his royal power and his title pertaining to government administration he opens an arena of competition to demonstrate the officials worthiness of being rewarded Perhaps he calls other people too and opens it like a competition. And, but he knows that this official is going to win the competition. He just wants to show this to everybody else. He commands, the king commands his vizier to invite the people to watch. He organizes an official welcoming ceremony and gives his favor to the official in a high place of gathering following a lofty examination and proclaims the official's merit there. So compare other aspects to this. We had two examples, right? One was that the exalted king sends the criminal to the court as the just sovereign. He does not just personally uh, administer justice or does not administer justice in private, right? And second, he wants to um, give his favors to an official. He does not do this through a you know, private channel of communication, but rather creates an occasion in order to demonstrate what is going on. Now, there's a subtle point here, uh, which is explained elsewhere in the Risale Inur, that we need to pay attention to. The worldly king, emperor, king, when he sends the criminal to the court, it is the judge who is the king's deputy, but a different person who administers justice in the court. The king stays in his palace, is taking care of other business. He is not simultaneously in the court. His metaphysical personality, his authority is in the court, but he is not personally in the court. Why? Because worldly kings cannot be in more than one place simultaneously. They are limited. They cannot do more than one thing at the same time, right? So this is where our, this is the point to which our example goes, but then we need to stop there and say, you know, take what is best from the example and leave which that which cannot be carried over to reality in the example. For God, there is no limitation. Time and space does not limit him. He 
is not limited by the number of acts that he is involved in that he does right he has unlimited power unlimited will he is above and beyond time and space he created time and space therefore he does not need officials and officers who are going to um, meet out justice administer dispose of etc etc in his name he does not need any of them he is capable of powerfully powerful uh, he is all powerful he has the power to do all of that himself right but but he also has instituted intermediaries in many of his acts the angels are intermediaries or the things that we see in nature and and think of as the causes of things right for instance right now where i am there is a mild thunderstorm going on maybe you are hearing the uh, noise in the background i'm not sure maybe yes maybe not um, rain comes from the sky and then that rain transforms the soil as we mentioned before in you know, bacteria uh, grow nitrogen they they synthesize nitrogen that goes into the plants the plants are growing so water coming from the sky rain appears to be a cause for the growth of plants this does not mean that it is the water that's making the plants grow it is god who is making this but he has put causes he has put intermediaries between us the observing human beings and himself one to promulgate to promulgate his tremendousness and names and attributes all his names and attributes so these causes are there to pro as uh, are, are not are not there as human officials but they are promulgators he does not need them to uh take care of business right but he has will to put them there as announcers as the thunderstorm is going on now based on prophetic traditions we know that the clouds are glorifying god they are promulgating his power they are glorifying god they are promulgating his power they are promulgating him being the provider they are promulgating his mercy etc his majesty uh, he, rather his mercy is becoming manifest in his majesty as through this majestic act of thunderstorm mercy reigns rain comes to the ground and provides uh, the the plants who that then grow right and second the causes are there in order to uh, preserve God's sanctity in our eyes because sometimes there are things that we uh, with our limited knowledge and understanding think of as ugly or evil or lowly and we do not want to relate them to God or we feel like if we relate them to God that is going to take away something from God's sanctity for instance and if you were living in the countryside or some people may may still be living in the countryside but it is um, a long gone thing for many of us uh, we could see cows or sheep or horses etc you know leaving their droppings around and to our human eyes and human nose and human understanding that looks like an ugly thing and we don't want to say you know god created this but well God created everything God created it too if it looks ugly or smells ugly or if we feel something ugly in it that is because of our limited understanding and conception of things for the millions of bacteria that are growing in it for the probably thousands of little bugs insects that are feeding on those bacteria for the probably hundreds of flies that are feeding on those tinier insects for the the chicken that eat those insects etc etc it is a beautiful source of provision but we don't want our minds to move fast from that 
which it identifies uh, or misidentifies as ugly directly to God, we put the causes in between. We say it smells because of, you know, this bacteria is producing this gas and that gas is, has a bad smell, etc., etc. So there may be other wisdoms. So these are two that are really important that we should mention at this point. So God has names and attributes. Those names and attributes are manifest in the creation. And each of those names and attributes are manifest according to certain patterns that we called uh, rules and to understand this we can think of this example of the, the the emperor who appears in different departments of his uh, government with different names and titles işte velillahi mesela ala ezel ebed sultanının pek çok esma esma hüsnası vardır tecelliyat celaliye ve tezahürat cemaliye ile pek çok şuunatı ve unvanları vardır Nur ve zulmet, yaz ve kış, cennet ve cehennemin vücudunu iktiza eden isim ve ünvan ve şe'ni ise kanunu tenasül, kanunu müsabaka, kanunu teavün gibi pek çok umumi kanunlar misillü kanunu mübarezenin dahi bir derece tamimini isterler. Kalp etrafındaki ilhamat ve vesveselerin mübarezelerinden tut, ta sema afakında melaike ve şeytanların mübarezesine kadar o kanunun şümulünü iktiza eder. Thus, and to God is the highest similitude. This is Quran chapter 16, verse 60. We talked about it before. This is mentioned uh, at the beginning of uh, you know, parables to indicate what we just talked about. That the parable representation is there to convey a meaning. Take the good meaning, leave the rest. The Sultan of pre-eternity and post-eternity, God. Right? He is the Sultan. He is the the one who holds royal power in pre-eternity and post-eternity, eternally, above and beyond time. He has many beautiful divine names. The Sultan of pre-eternity and post-eternity has many beautiful divine names. He has many conducts and titles with majestic manifestations and beautiful appearances his name title and characteristic conduct that entail the existence of light and darkness summer and winter paradise and hell demand that the law of confrontation be publicized to some extent like the law of reproduction the law of competition and the law of mutual assistance so let's read this again this sentence his name title and characteristic conduct that entail the existence of light and darkness, summer and winter, paradise and hell, we could say good and evil, opposites that cannot be together at the same time and, and, and come into confrontation with the, when they encounter one another. Where there is light, there cannot be darkness. Where there is darkness, there cannot be light. When the summer comes, the winter goes. When the winter comes, the summer goes. They cannot stay together. Where there's paradise, you cannot have hell. Where there's hell, you cannot have a whiff of paradise. You cannot have uh, the, the benefits of paradise. So these are separated from one another. And they are in opposition to, to one another. And they come into confrontation in the creation. And this is a manifestation of God's conducts and titles and names and titles right so the name title and characteristic conduct that entail these op op um, opposites coming into co uh, confrontation demand that the love of confrontation be publicized to some extent that is that we see it everywhere that is that it is not limited to a single place but we see it permitting uh, the the, the creation to a large extent like the law of reproduction so that's another law that is the manifestation of other names other titles other you know, characteristic conducts we see that law of reproduction in the on on the on the face of the earth uh, wherever, wherever we see life right one of the um, properties of life is that living beings reproduce 
if it is plants, they may be reproducing through seeds. And if it is, uh, you know, mushrooms, they may be reproducing through spores. If it is uh, trees, there might be like the pollination, animals, etc. There is this law that we see everywhere. It is a general law. It is general because it is the manifestation of a name that is uh, that God is revealing in a universal way or the, the law of competition so there will be competition uh, and, and, and we can see especially among the uh, in among human beings right that thanks to that law of competition Abu Bakr's are being separated from Abu Jahl's. The, the way that we saw the emperor would give his favors to the official that he knows merits a reward, right? He does not do it just by you know, calling the person, the official, and saying, I give you my favor, but rather opened up a, an arena of competition. This world, this worldly life is an arena of competition. God knew the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Adam Alayhi Salam was lying lifeless as dried clay in the form of a human being but without life. God knew that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was his most beloved cuddled guest in the in existence in, in, in the creation. He did not need all of this. God did not need to bring all this world into existence. Uh, you know, send prof the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the world to live the 63 years that he lived, etc., etc. He did not need any of that. He knew that he was his beloved and he could have taken him directly to paradise. But no, God promulgated promulgated, showed to all of us that the Prophet ﷺ was the Prophet ﷺ. And he also showed to all of us that Abu Bakr radiallahu an was Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the Siddiq, the voracious one. And he also showed to us that Abu Jahl is Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance, that he deserves hell and Abu Bakr radiallahu an deserves paradise. So he showed all of this. So similarly, right, the law of confrontation be publicized to some extent. He, God, shows it. Like the law of reproduction, the law of competition, and the law of mutual assistance. And we can see these two working in the uh, in in nature too. Law of competition. Yeah, there is a competition between species, which Darwin mistook as uh, you know survival of the fittest and etc etc right there is a law of competition that's the manifestation of a divine name a title a characteristic conduct but along with it there is also the law of mutual assistance in the sense that within the realm of wisdom where things are happening according to what appears to be causal relationships which are actually the manifestations of god's um you know custom Right in this world of wisdom, everything is ha helping everything. The clouds that gathered in the sky and pouring down this rain here are helping the trees that are on the ground and benefiting from the rain and everything that comes with the rain. But at the same time, the trees are sucking that water up from the soil and exposing it to the atmosphere so that the water can evaporate back and they're helping the clouds so there is this mutual assistance between everything in the creation too so like these laws right the name title and characteristic conduct that entail the existence of light and darkness summer and winter paradise and hell demand that the law of confrontation be publicized to some extent too this entails the extension of this law all the way from the confrontation of inspirations and obsessive whispering surrounding the heart which we can all feel in our own selves 
right divine inspirations so what, what, you know one moment you want to be really nice you want to you think of your lord you are filled with these lofty emotions senses ideas next moment something happens and you know you're in a, in a state of rage and you your you can feel that your lower soul is churning in there and wants to push you towards something that is evil and it is also your heart is receiving these whisperings from satan then your lower soul hears it and turns it into an obsessive whispering an obsessive thought and pushes you and prods you right it becomes this compulsive thing that you cannot get rid of that is what we feel in ourselves in ourselves it may be you know from angelic and divine inspirations to the obsessive whisperings of the lower soul and satan and the allurement of the world right the same law the same law applies here in ourself from there all the way to the confrontation of the angels and satans on the horizons of the heavens it all makes sense once we understand this thing that is going on in ourself and understand that that is the manifestation of certain divine names and attributes and conducts it makes perfect sense that this will be extended to the horizons of the heavens where angels and satans are going to be confronting one another now a side note here of course the existence of angels and satans that they are in a state of confrontation right these are not things that we can rationally um establish and and and prove we need revelation to understand it because these are not things that are in the visible realm at least for you know ordinary people like myself i have never seen an angel knowing that it's an angel i have never seen in the, the the satan or its uh you know friends and followers uh human followers or jinn followers uh knowing that this is a satan i've never i've never seen it but i i have full certainty full conviction certainty that they exist and they are in a state of confrontation why because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us because it is mentioned in the quran and we know a lot of detail about these issues from revelation and the prophetic traditions okay however if i learn something from the prophetic traditions and the quran but it just did not make sense my intellect perceived it as an inconceivable impossibility what would happen then right like the the notion of tesli's trinity in christianity they tell people it's, it's a mystery you you can't get it just just take it this is faith they would say you know faith does not require reason or faith cannot be with reason we are not like that alhamdulillah we are not like that for us believers muslim believers faith and belief go hand in hand together we don't even need separate words for them uh, you know but sometimes it helps to uh, distinguish as as it is happening now but for us faith and belief goes hand in hand it is all reasonable it all makes sense and Ustad Nursi is showing here to us how it makes sense why it makes sense this is kalam this is you know what uh, is translated as dialectical the theology uh, you know dialectical theology is usually limited to uh, what is called aqliyat, intellectual or rational matters uh, about God's existence and the prophethood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and scholars of dialectical theology have traditionally left matters like this the angels, the existence of hell and heaven, etc. Uh, to, to the revelation saying once uh, it is established that the revelation is God's word and God is the all-knower all-powerful etc we do not need further evidence to know that what is in the revelation is reality this is correct we don't need further evidence uh, however we are living in a time and age that first 
our lower souls are aggrandized second satan has a lot of means to reach uh, reach uh, you know from the darkest corners of its domains to the most innocent minds through the internet through tv through education uh, systems so the challenges to belief in our day and age are so much that alhamdulillah god sent us a scholar like ustad nursi who shows us that this is not only established through revelation and you know a tenet of faith that we need to accept and believe with certainty because we are certain we have certainty that the report uh, that is being uh, conveyed to us from god in the quran and the prophet wasallam, in prophetic traditions are veracious but also that it makes sense it makes complete sense alhamdulillah fifth step inshallah we will read the fifth step too madem arzdan semaya gidip gelmek var semadan arza inip çıkmak oluyor ehemmiyetli levazimatı arziye oradan gönderiliyor ve madem ervahı taybeler semaya gidiyorlar elbette ervahı habise dahi ahyarı takliden semavat memleketine gitmeye teşebbüs edecekler çünkü vücut letafet ve hiffetleri var hem şüphesiz tar ve reddedilecekler çünkü mahiyetçe şeraret ve nuhusetleri vardır. Since there is coming and going from the earth to the heavens, descent from descent from and ascent to the heavens takes take place. Important necessities of the earth are being sent from there. What necessities? Well, it is raining right now. Uh, the thunderstorm. Uh, turned into a, a rain it's pouring down or inspirations divine inspirations to to our heart where are they coming from if they are especially if they're angelic they are coming from the heavens and since good spirits travel to the heavens starting with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know in the prophetic ascension he traveled to the heavens but you know Others, others uh, too, uh, you know, saints in their, uh, those who advance in the Sufi path in their journey, right? Say this, Luke, in their uh, journey on the path, sometimes their spirits travel to the realm. You know, in, in Ibn Arabi's, for instance, uh, books, we he gives us detailed descriptions of many things that you know one would not fit into one lifetime if one wanted to travel to those places at the time that he lived on earth or you know in the heavens etc it's not possible the spirit travels to all these places now that doesn't mean that the spirit when it travels sees everything as it is and therefore can convey to us because you know there are limitations in the way that if um i were looking on the on the um cup well i'm looking at, at, at a cup now right all i see is a cup a porcelain with some uh, you know motifs colors etc on it but i'm not seeing that there are all sorts of you know bacteria germs perhaps dust etc etc it just is not visible to me or I am seeing one side of the cup and I'm not seeing the other side. Perhaps there is a fly that came and landed on it on the other side. It's not going to be understandable to me. Or there might, sometimes, you know, they, they show you an image, a little tiny part of something. And they tell you, guess what this is? You know, you try hard and it can be this, it can be that. And later when they show you the bigger picture, perhaps you find out that it was the scale of a fish or the tip of uh, the, the, the stalk of a, a wheat stalk or something like that, right? When you see something only partially from a particular angle, angle, you don't necessarily comprehend what exactly it is and you can't necessarily convey it as it is which is an exception for prophets and the prophet وسلم, when he ascended to the heavens they are shown things as they are right but at any rate the spirits travel 
The spirits also travel um, when we sleep. If we sleep with uh, in, in a state of wudu, for instance, when the spirit travels, it can ascend all the way to you know lofty places. But if we fall asleep and we are not in wudu, when we ascend there, well, we will probably be told, well, from here on, it is only the clean that can go. And since uh, not having wudu is a state of ritual uh, uncleanliness, we may not be able to go above that. So anyway. Since good spirits travel to the heavens, of course, vile spirits will also attempt to travel to the land of the heavens in imitation of the good ones. They are curious, they want to bring harm to there too, for they have bodily subtlety and lightness. So why can the spirit travel to the heavens? Because it has subtlety and lightness. It is not made of dense matter. Well, some of the vile spirits are not made of dense matter either. Then they can attempt to travel. So if we were to try to simplify this, imagine a, a balloon filled with hel helium, right? The balloon filled with helium, because it is lighter than the atmospheric gases, goes up like that. The spirit uh, is not bound by gravity and it can travel up and down. And the vile spirits that are confined to earth will also attempt to travel to the land of the heavens in imitation of the good ones. And we already established in earlier steps that the heavens must be a place of innocent spirits. Good resides there. And without a doubt, they will be expelled and rejected because you know that that's a, that's a lofty place not everything can go there they will be expelled and rejected for they have an evil and ominous quiddity they are subtle and light but that doesn't mean that they are good they are evil and ominous hem bila şek vela şüphe şu muamele mühimmenin şu mübareze imaneviyenin alemi şehadette bir alameti bir işareti bulunacaktır Moreover, without dubiousness and doubt, with certainty, that important transaction, that important affair, that they are going up there and they are being rejected and expelled, and that metaphysical confrontation will have a mark and sign in the realm of witnessing. Because it's an important thing. It is something that we should be, um, uh, we, we, we should be exposed to. It is... Remember we said from the inspirations and uh, evil whisperings, obsessive whisperings that come to the heart, all the way to the confrontation of the Satans and angels in the horizons of the heavens. Well, this is the extent from the lowest, closest circle to the furthest circle. If we are experiencing uh, it in the closest circle as human beings who are here to witness God's creation, that too should be exposed to us. Moreover, without, a dub without dubiousness and doubt, that important transaction affair and metaphysical confrontation will have a mark and sign in the realm of witnessing. Çünkü, saltanat-ı rububiyetin hikmeti iktiza eder ki, zi şuur için bahusuz en mühim vazifesi müşahede ve şehadet ve dellallık ve nezaret olan insan için tasarrufat-ı gaybiyenin mühimlerine bir işaret koysun, birer alamet bıraksın. Nasıl ki nihayetsiz bahar mucizatına yağmuru işaret koymuş ve havarik saltan sanatına esbabı zahireyi alamet etmiş. Ta alem şehadet ehlini işhad etsin. Belki o acip temaşaya umum ehli semavat ve sekene-i arzın enzarı dikkatlerini celbetsin. Yani o koca semavatı etrafında nöbet tarlar dizilmiş, burçları tezyin edilmiş bir kale hükmünde bir şehir suretine gösterip haşmet rububiyetini tefekkür ettirsin. So let's repeat the previous sentence and then move on from there. Moreover, without dubiousness and doubt, the, with certainty, that important transaction and metaphysical confrontation of the Satans and angels, and, that's that, and that evil spirits will attempt to ascend to the heavens and they will be uh, ejected, rejected, expelled, chased, will have a mark and a sign in the realm of witnessing. Because 
the wisdom of the royal power of lordship entails that he god puts a sign and leaves a mark on the important ones of the unseen disposal for the conscious beings unseen disposals for the conscious beings i.e there are lots of things that are happening in the seen realm and we are directly witnessing them but there is significantly more than this that's happening in the unseen realm and some of them it makes sense for us to be uh, made witnesses the the wisdom of the royal power of lordship right sultana royal power of lordship necessitates the wisdom of royal power of lordship necessitates it being exposed and promulgated and demonstrated and shown in the way that when you go to a government office today for instance you will see some sign of uh, the, the power of the state perhaps a flag perhaps the picture of the president or king of the country you are living some symbol that uh, that symbolizes the power of the state right the the wisdom of the royal power or lordship entails that big events big events that are direct consequences of that royal power of lordship be made public entails that he god puts a sign and leaves a mark on the important ones of the unseen disposals his acts in the unseen realm for the conscious beings and especially for the human beings why human beings because whose most important duty is to observe witness proclaim and oversee that's our job observe witness proclaim glorify exalt god and also oversee we are the vice chairs of god on earth in the way that he has god has placed rain as a sign for the unlimited miracles of spring and made apparent causes a mark for the wonders of his artistry right so in the way that so this is an example of the proclamation of his royal power in the way that he has placed rain as a sign for the unlimited miracles of spring it rains plants start to grow so we just talked about this right we can think of this as mere causality in the material realm there is nothing beyond what we are seeing etc etc some you know heedless minds may go to this conclusion but we can also see that water or not rain or not sun or not air or not gravity or not soil or not what whatever is there or not this plant the seed cannot turn into this plant that's that's coming out or this piece of wood that is like dead in the winter cannot be filled with teeming life in the way that it is right now it cannot happen within the realm of this material things elements and molecules and you know force and matter and energy and what whatever they cannot come together and account for this there has to be something outside of this if that is the case if that is the case then this is not necessary this is not necessary then what is its purpose what is the wisdom it being here right then rain is not necessary for the plant to grow because it is not the rain that makes the plant grow but then then why is the rain why is the rain the rain is a sign for the unlimited miracles of spring i mean god's miracles in spring and and and in the way right that he made apparent causes a mark of the wonders of his artistry so like this there will be a mark there will be a mark marking his royal power in that confrontation between angels and the satans in the horizons of the heavens too and we will be exposed to it we will see it right so that so that god holds the inhabitants of the realm of witnessing as witnesses and in fact 
draws the careful sights of all denizens of the heavens and all inhabitants of the earth to that amazing spectacle. That is to say, he makes them contemplate the sublimity of his lordship by displaying the entire heavens like a fortress with adorned towers and surrounded by guards or in the image of a city. How so? Well, remember the, the, the, the verse, he made stars like missiles, shooting stars like missiles, chasing, we know based on prophetic traditions, chasing Satan's. Madem şu mübareze-i ulviyenin ilanı hikmeten lazımdır, elbette ona bir işaret vardır. Halbuki bu hadisat-ı cevviye ve semaviye içinde şu ilana münasip hiçbir hadise görünmüyor. Bundan daha ensebi yoktur. Zira yüksek kalelerin muhkem burçlarından atılan mancınıklar ve işaret fişeklerine benzeyen şu hadise-i necmiye, bu recmi şeytana ne kadar ensep düştüğü bedaheten anlaşılır. Halbuki şu hadisenin bu hikmetten ve şu gayeden başka ona, müna- ona münasip bir hikmeti bilinmiyor. Sair hadisat öyle değil. Hem şu hikmet zaman Adem'den beri meşhurdur ve ehli hakikat için meşhuddur. So this is the conclusion of what we have been um, analyzing. Since the proclamation of this lofty confrontation is required by wisdom, of course, there will be a sign for it. Since the proclamation of this lofty confrontation, the confrontation between the evil spirits and angels at the horizons of the heavens is required by wisdom that it is proclaimed is required by wisdom of course there will be a sign for it what is that sign going to be then so up to this point it all makes sense there, there should be a sign then look what can be this sign can the moon be the sign can the rain be the sign can the clouds be the sign because we are looking at the horizons of the heavens right we are looking up what can it be however none of the atmospheric and heavenly events or space events appear to be suitable for this proclamation there is nothing more suitable than this so like except for that except for one incident there is nothing more suitable than this, that is the shooting stars. Hence, it is understood with intuitive clarity that these astral events, these events of the stars, that resemble catapult projectiles or signal flares shot from the secure towers of high fortresses fit the pelting of Satan most suitably. Pelting of, chasing of Satan with you know stones most suitably and no other wisdom is known to suit that event the shooting of shooting stars the comets other than this wisdom and purpose other events are unlike this moreover this wisdom has been well known since the time of adam and has been witnessed by the people of reality so it all makes sense alhamdulillah our kalam, our uh, justification of what we believe is all reasonable. All makes sense to the intellect and the heart is also drawn to it. If the intellect, if it did not make sense to the intellect, there would have to be a confrontation between the intellect and the heart. As in the case of, once again, uh, you know, Christians being told that they have to believe in Trinity, although it does not make rational sense, it is something mystical and they have to take it. We don't have it. It all makes sense. There may be points beyond which our intellect cannot go, so we cannot um, pervade the reality of certain things in the way that our minds cannot comprehend the reality of God's, the quiddity of God's entity, for instance. But that is not a matter of confrontation and conflict between the heart and the intellect. 
it is not an inconceivable matter. It just is beyond the reach of our intellect. But it, it is possible. Right? It is not only possible, it is necessary. It is not something that the intellect objects to. And therefore, we don't have to suffer from this um, schizophrenic trouble that emerges between the intellect and the heart when people, believers of various religions, are told, you know, this is what the intellect shows, this is what you have to believe. And they start to live schizophrenic lives in which they compartmentalize their lives as, you know, I go to the work, I work in the laboratory, and this is what I do and believe in the laboratory, and then I go to the church or temple or whatever, and I, I you know, perform what the performance of that place necessitates. We are not like that. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah, we will continue with the sixth and seventh uh, steps and see um, if, inshallah, we can finish in the next episode and that will leave time for us to turn to uh, the Ramadan, the treaties on Ramadan, uh, inshallah, in the month of Ramadan. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وآخر الدواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة اللهم صل على سيدنا